Ibra di testa, Tonali, gol! Sandro, meritato! Sandro, Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Fisher, joined by your favourite 80s porn star, Anthony Talgrud. <laughs> Hello, what's up, guys? Uh, new look, but same same guy. Um, I'm here. That's me, the guy next to Ollie. And uh, yeah, we got the guy underneath Ollie with us as well. I don't want to be underneath either. either <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Figuratively That's... or psychologically. <laughs> yeah. So uh, episode 201, boys, we're into a new, a new set here. Um mm-hmm. And we got two games to recap and one game to preview as well, so going to be a good one. Um, pretty straightforward one this as well because we can just skip over the first game pretty much and, and yep. move on to the events of last night in the capital. Uh, cup semi-final, second leg against Inter. We knew it was going to be difficult. Um, we we knew that obviously with the first leg having been nil-nil, um, we didn't concede an away goal, but it's still going to be a tough ask against a team that are probably... They've got a better squad on paper, you know, they're, they're deeper and um, they're on a good run. Um, and we lost 3-0. It just didn't go to plan at all, did it? We conceded within a few minutes um, and then we conceded again before half time. And um, we had our moments, we had big, big periods of pressure where we really looked like we were going to um, we were gonna score the goal to get us back into it. We did score the goal to get ourselves back into it that was ruled off for offside. Uh, and then we conceded a third night to forget. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, look. I, after yesterday's game and the way I celebrated, I can't even remember a week ago. So, um, yeah, it's that game <laughs> sucked. That wasn't fun to watch. Um, next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it always sucks losing a derby in a semifinal for a cup that's irrelevant to me. Uh, but. I am more concentrated on the league and I could care less. And the big bonus to this is, yes, obviously we lost a derby embarrassingly and we we don't have a chance of that silverware, but there's a Derby d'Italia final in between the last two games of the season and Inter still in the title race. So that's a lot of added pressure. They have two midweek games now, um, including one on Wednesday. Well, they got one on Wednesday and then one Sunday. So they'll have two back to back this week. And then um, I think it, when is the the cup final? It's like the 13th or something like that? I, I think it's between round 36 and 37 rather than that sounds about right. 38. But yeah, still, okay. I mean, it, it creates yeah. creates added fatigue and, and all that. Um, exactly. And it's a game that they'll definitely want to win given that it's Juve. And it's um, Juve's only chance to get a trophy this season, so they're going to go all out too. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if that's I an exhausting that. affair. I, I don't want Juve to get a trophy because they just – even their shitty years, they get something, but I want Inter to get a trophy even less. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like a double-edged sword. Uh, yeah, it's really not great, is it? Yeah, I honestly um, rather Juve get it just so Hakan doesn't get anything. Well, he got the Super Cup, which he shouldn't have been able to play in because he wasn't a part of the team. But whatever, that's that's a petty argument that I'm not going to make anymore. It just pop there is a, there is one thing as well. If if Inter were to win the cup and the league, and we finish second in the league, we would play Inter for the Super Cup because that's how it works. You mm-hmm. know, if a team's won both the league and cup, then the second place team go into the Super Cup. So that'd be something to look forward to. Um, but yeah, this game was not good. Uh, I look, they're a good team. Um, they, they've beaten us comfortably in derbies in recent memory. That that's going to happen. I also don't think that our performance was absolutely terrible. I think we created plenty. We had our moments. We're just lacking a bit of killer edge in the final third, but how many weeks have we been saying that for now? One thing I will say about our performances, I thought it was really, really naive. Um, I think back to that derby that we lost 3-0 last season in the league and that real power shift in terms of the Scudetto race. We conceded early in that, and the key thing was to make sure you get to half time still in the game. Um, we conceded a second in in this one just before half time, and that made it really, really difficult for us. You know, needing two goals in the second half, we had to push and push, and then you concede a third because you have to push. You know, it played straight into their hands. It was a little bit disappointing that they will probably not have a more routine three 0 win this season. Well, they did like against say, Roma. Well, it's three one weekend. But... Oh, you're right. I forgot they scored a late one, but yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, but still, that that's the thing, you know, they're allowed to game manage. Um, yes, that, that goal shouldn't have been called off. You know, it shouldn't have been an offside. Um, I think uh, for the for the avoidance of doubt, that rule needs to be made a little bit more clear. But for me, the way that I saw that, the angles that I've seen it, the still photos, the video replays, if he's been blocked by anyone, Handanovic, Handanovic this is, then it's his own defenders rather than Kalulu. Mm-hmm. That's what Those I thought, Those are the ones too. in his sight line first and foremost. Um, and also, um, the referee was called over to the VAR monitor to look for a handball, not an offside, because Handanovic hadn't even appealed for an offside. Mm-hmm. You know, um, So then he went and took a look at it, and then he came away from the monitor and was about to make his decision, and then he went back and took another look at it. So you want to tell me that that was clear and obvious? That clear and obvious that you had to go back and look at it again to find some reason to rule out the goal. Yeah. Anyway, after happened, after the inter bench came over and yelled at him, that's why he went back. By the way, I don't know if yeah. you guys saw that, but so there's that, and then it's the same referee that's um was just assigned to the Inter Bologna midweek game on Wednesday. So that's awesome. Um, you can just tell where this shit's all heading with Doveri and Inter. It's it's interesting, you know, the team that that was always accused of having the referees in the bags, um, Juve, they they send their sporting director to enter, or rather enter buys them, and all of a sudden the, the match fixing claims go to enter. I don't know what's <clears throat> yeah. what's the common denominator here, but um, to go back to the game, I thought after the twenty eighth minute we were the better team for the the entire duration after that. I thought the twenty eighth mm. minute up the first twenty eight minutes, we were awful. Um, we deserved all the punishment they gave us. But after that, we were the better team, and we just we couldn't finish our chances. And Inter own they are a quality team. They only need one opportunity, and they're going to score. Whereas we need, yeah. as we saw uh, against Lazio, twenty eight wow. opportunities to score. Um, so if you're we're playing a team that's not going to give you those chances, then you're just you're not going to score. That's what we ended up with, and it sucks because that game was. I mean, going into it, obviously, you heard the way I talked about it last week on the pod was, you know, everything plays into our favor. We get one away goal, we're, we're through. The scoring draw, we're through, and all that crap. And uh, even when they went up 1-0, it didn't even matter. It was like nothing happened because all we needed was right, a 1-1. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just we couldn't even keep that. I think the XG was significantly in our favor, but obviously that doesn't win you games. Scoring goals does. So, um, yeah, it, it was frustrating. But at the end of the day, I think, them having six games, one being huge and irrelevant to the league, plays into our favor when we have four. So, yeah, no, that's that's a valid point. Uh, it's disappointing, but um, yeah, and I, I hate to do this, but you got to give a little bit of credit to to Inter as well. I mean, Lautaro is one of those strikers. He gets a lot of criticism, uh, but he has a knack for scoring big goals, and he took that first goal really well, and the second one as well. You know, I think Inzaghi. Kind of, I won't say it was a, a risky move, but it was perhaps a bold move to play Lautaro and Correa up front together. Uh, but it worked perfectly because they exploit the the. I'm not going to say it's a lack of chemistry between Kalulu and Tamori, but let's say when you put more two mobile forwards up against those two, uh, they were found wanting from a positional sense, and and their athleticism couldn't quite make up for it this time. You know, they were at sixes and sevens for the second goal, uh, slipped their own goal, nice finish. And it wasn't the best performance from either of them. You know, they found it tough against two very good forwards in this league. And yeah, had to push, conceded a third goal. That really flattered them. Um, I think if we'd have lost 2-1 on the night or something like that, uh, might have been more fair, but I'm not too bothered. I mean, the most important thing was the response, and we'll come on to that. But, uh, yeah, it was a night to forget. Let's, should we just do tops and flops and move on? Yeah, I don't really have a top. Um, Benacer. I'm going to say Benacer was remember. good. Was, Benacer was the one who had the goal called off, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah, okay, and he had a good yeah. game. He, he, was a, he was a battler in midfield. Um, everyone else looked a bit tired, a bit leggy. Some people said Leo had a good performance, but for me, he, he had two shots from just inside the um, the edge of the box, and he should have done better with both of them. The first yeah. one went, was a near post save. The second one was straight into Handanovic's arms. He should Benacer have done had that goal called off, but I thought he was actually awful. In fact, I remember saying he should have came off at halftime because I, it's now the second game in a row where we've started Kessie um, as the attacking mid against Inter, and it's been just 
garbage until Brahim mm-hmm. comes on. For whatever reason, Brahim does better in that area against Inter, specifically Inter. Um, so I think we should have started with that, and, and I would have moved Kessie over for Benacer. But people are saying Tonali was really bad too, and I think he also was. It, it's hard to think back after, you know, after everything that happened with the Lazio game. Yeah. But, um, that midfield pivot, I guess, is my flop. Yeah, and um, uh, the midfield pairing, it's a tough ask when you... Um, look, when Kessie plays that advanced role, it's not necessarily because of what he's expected to do in attack. Like, he's not going to be expected to score a brace every single time. But the whole reason he was put there is to neutralise Brozovic. And it didn't work. Brozovic was free. He was able to mm-hmm. dictate play. And then that makes things really tough for Tonali and Benacer, who... Um, are required to take on more of a defensive role than they'd like to in a normal game to thwart um, Barella and Chalanoglu. Well, I thought Chalanoglu had a poor game, for example, but Barella, you know, you've got a lot of quality. So, yeah, that made things quite tough. Um, but, yeah, top's quite tough to pick then. A flop is pretty easy for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go on. Cell knockers every day. Did he even play? He started, didn't he? Yeah, he got subbed off at he half did? time, didn't he? Or oh, vice shoot. versa. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm finding it tough to give it to any. I mean, look, we didn't score and we conceded three goals. So that implies that your defense was pretty bad, uh, but you couldn't get anything going in attack either. Um, but I, I'll, I'll give my flop a joint to Tamari and Kalulu. I mean, they have been so, so good for us and they have had a lot of praise from our fan base and rightly so. But I think this was just a reminder that, you know, sometimes they're going to run into difficulties and it's about how they weather those storms. And the answer is they didn't. It was a pretty poor performance uh, from both of them. I would say Tamari was slightly worse. Um, he was he was caught diving in a little bit too much and, you know, against two quick forwards like Lautaro and Correa, you aren't going to have as much opportunity to make up any space that you've left in behind you. And yeah, it was, it was tough. I was pretty surprised with how poorly they played. Yeah. Kalulu looked lost parts like when they were defending. And I was like, this looks so out of character for both of them. I'm worried it's becoming a habit because that's who I was actually going to pick as my flop for the Lazio game was the Tomori Kalulu pairing. So it, I thought that was really bad as well. Worse, I, mean, I would argue. They're both young, obviously. Um, they they're still in their first stages as a centre back pairing, should we say? And they are allowed some games or some moments where they're not on it, but it can't be costing you in big games like that, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and th- as I say, they're young; they will learn from it and grow from experience like that. Uh, but I think it was also just a reminder for the fan base as well to to cool the Jets a little bit on these two being like the best centre-back pair in the league and all that. Um, when we came up against a very good defence and we, yeah, we were we were kind of picked apart um, in, with national performance. Yeah. Well, let's hop to Lazio so we could uh, yeah. have a fun podcast. Woohoo! Woo! Now all of a sudden the mood changes. The yeah. party starts. Um, it's like every every viewer actually, just dropped out in the first thirteen minutes. There didn't want to hear that. Yeah, guy. probably. Um, this one didn't start great either. We conceded <laughs> within five minutes again, and it was another bit of near post movement from a centre forward that you should be watching that let us down. So you know you mentioned that the that Kalulu tomorrow would be your flops for this game. Um, I um, said in our chat and stuff that I attribute a bit more blame to Kalulu for the first goal than I do to Mori. I think Teo gets burst past by uh, Lazzari. I think it was Lazzari and gives up on the play altogether. But he wasn't going to prevent the cross coming in. Tamori could move more towards Minyan's eye line and then maybe cut the ball out. But when, when, having it, when the ball passes that, I don't think he can cut it out not quite. Not without the risk of diverting it into his own net. But Kalulu... He's stood here. He has a mobile 25 goals this season, 25, now on 26. He has him the other side. Like, you know, he's in a good position. He's He's got his runner away from the goal side and he just stops. He just stops and lets him mobile go in there and score. So that was not great. I didn't like that, you know. 
if there's one person you pick up, it's Chiro. Yeah, no, that was my thought too. I mean, you see, I actually blame Tomori more for it because he could have made a challenge to stop that ball. I think he, in his head, Mike was right behind him, but Mike obviously wasn't. He was guarding his near post. And uh, I think that's why Tamori didn't make the challenge, but I, th I think he could have got it there. He just kind of let it spin by him. And I think Kalulu was expecting that as well. Um, so it was just an overall, like, just lack of communication. Thing, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't even say yeah. miss. They just didn't communicate at all. There was, I mean, Mike should have been saying, like, you know, I got near post or something, or like, get in front of it, try and save it. I don't know. There's some words that they could say to each other to, to to do something but it sounded like yeah. they all just had one thought and it wasn't the same between any of them so it is what it is there but i think i think tomori um tomori in leaving the ball uh whether he could get to it or not he's he's not out of line to assume that there'll be cover behind him you know even if that ball gets past him i think it's reasonable for him to think well kalulu won't let him overly get in so it's all good uh, and then it happened. But yeah, I agree. Maybe he could have, have done something to disrupt the cross. And also, you know, the, there was something that could have been done to stop the cross coming in in the first place because somebody should have made sure that Lazuli wasn't allowed to burst free down to the byline. So it was a calamity of errors for the first goal, really, uh, which was nice. To and it put in a real, real shit situation because after 10 minutes up until half time, I think it would be fair to say we dominated the game. Um, we created opportunities um whether you can call them clear cut or not i i don't know um but we were certainly the better side up until half time but we went in at the break trailing again so then it became really straightforward you either score two goals or however many goals are needed to win the game or it's pretty much curtains and we produced a response yeah i think uh once again it was going into a game knowing how little we needed to secure something this time being need a draw to secure champions league because we knew Sornitana had beat Fiorentina uh, that morning. And it was just like when we were top of the table and everyone dropped points and we had that chance to extend the lead and, and we couldn't score a goal after the international break. And then we, now we've been in the situation we've been in. It's just, we struggle with the idea that we're not trailing. You know, when, when we are leading the pack, we, we have a hard time, pushing forward like we we're an underdog team that's why we play better away that's why we've been playing better chasing the title as opposed to holding on to it and so i think that kind of got in our heads a little bit it was like all we need to do is the bare minimum and, and we're good we secure our goal for next season and i think going down early actually played to our advantage because all of a sudden we're trailing now we're pushing for it the hard part was lazio didn't have to push but they're not a team who who sits back so mm, that actually yeah. worked out really well for us um I don't remember what minute we got the first goal. What, when was that? Like 65? 49. Was it that yeah, right it was immediately after halftime? Yeah, it was in yeah. five minutes. That's why it was so important that we got the goal before yeah. the hour mark for me because it then gave us the time that we needed mm -hmm. to, to realise that we can win this. Because as you yeah. rightly say, we came up against a team that concedes space at the best of times mm -hmm. and asked last defender will go lead against... And, and that know, first goal that we scored was... Beautiful poacher's goal. I mean, yeah, yeah that, or, um, uh, Giroud had to run in, but he dove in. And, mm. you know, it's, I'll get to uh, tops and flops. So you're going to laugh at this next statement once we get there. But that's something you're not seeing Zlatan doing. Zlatan's not taking mm. a, a slide challenge inside the box. No, it has to, to be right goal. at him. It, exactly. Now, yeah. Zlatan's going to be my top. So we'll get to my reason for that later. But, um, Maddie I have reason. Serious, Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I can see it in his eyes. Um, but that that play, Liao just breaks down. He runs straight to the, the the byline and just cuts it back inside, which he hadn't done the entire game up to that point mm. in the first half. Every time Liao got the ball, he was either dispossessed or, or shot it, and it was saved. He tried to do everything on his own. The first chance he had to make a pass for an assist, he gets the assist, and it was great Giroud goal. You saw how mad Giroud was when he got subbed off because he almost had that second one. Um, when he was going into the, the dugouts, you see him like slam the roof of the tunnel. And yeah, he was pissed, which I like to see. I like to see that. Yeah, uh, too. I, yeah I enjoyed uh, that. I think yeah. that either at halftime or pregame talk, the management, everyone gave them like, look, we have to win this game. If we don't win this game, Scudetto, goodbye. The sale of the club potentially hinged on that victory as well, securing Champions League. Like, they all knew it. The draw would have done it too, but... 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, we yeah. were in. I mean, Christ, it would have taken some collapse for us not to get yeah. in. But, but yeah. just but seeing the reaction great, from you everyone, know? you see Masara sitting on the, the bench after the game crying, the head and hands just like <laughs> elated. You see Gazidis on the pitch jumping yeah. up and down. You see Pioli and, and, um, and Maldini jumping, laughing, hugging each other. Like you see Giroud dogpiling on top of Pioli. Like everyone knew what was hinging on that game and they got the job done. So, I know there was some sort of talk where they're like, this is the one we got to do it. And, mm. and they fucking did it, boys. They did it. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. Inebriated for hours after that <laughs> game. Let me tell you. Uh, uh, well, if you can't celebrate after a win like that, when can you? Um, but yeah, the, the first goal, as you say, was a, was a perfect bit of link up playing. It was the first time I actually tweeted saying Liao's playing against us here. And I expected to go into my mentions and see loads of people saying, well done. And stuff, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, he, he had not been great with his decision making up until that point in the game. But he finally picked his head up and realised that you know he had an option, um, and, and got a nice assist. His his work on the night, his his immense dribbling, which we always see, it deserved an assist. To be fair, but yeah, she rode right place, right time, gambled on it, got there first, turned it in. Funny how both goals kind of like. Neither were emphatic. They both kind of scrambled over the goal line. Yeah. I quite liked that. It, it was shithousery at its I finest. I couldn't tell if Giroud decided in at first because it looked like he was that kind of angle, but no, it was in. And I love that he ran and got the ball straight away as well from the goal mouth as yep. if to say, we're not done here. We're not celebrating exactly. that. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then we were pushing and pushing. We had our moments. Messias nearly got um, a sixth league goal of the season when he curled that one just past the far post. Um, we had our moments, as you say, Giroud could have had a second. And it looked like it was done and dusted. It looked like Lazio had just about done enough to dig in for a draw. And we produced something out of out of nowhere. I say out of nowhere, really. The two forwards who we've been missing in recent weeks due to injury and um, you know, lack of general fitness, Ibrahimovic and Rebic, those were the ones who had a massive hand in the winning goal off the bench. So they deserve credit. Mm. Thought Rebic was really good. His fight was there. He answered all those questions about unhappy over his work rate and stuff. Um, put in a cross that caused just enough doubt, and then there you go. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to give my analysis of that goal because I've watched it 150 times. If you follow me on Instagram, yeah. it's on my story with Rocky Music. It's fantastic. It'll bring a tear to your eye. It's done it to me every time, and that's how I went to bed. That's what I woke up to this morning. It's pathetic, but it's all I've listened to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's bad, you dude. Would. I've watched it way too many times, um, and no one cares. No one's replying to my story at all because <laughs> no one follows me. <laughs> I'll do it is, now. Is football related? They're just now. like, okay, that's. Not I true. literally I hate did, when but... people put that stuff on their social media stories. I never post anything on my story, but I was like, this is it. Oh, Semper Milan just replied to my story. Amazing. Nice. Oh, uh, um, you must be pretty popular. I'm popping, dude. I'm popping off. Also, um, side note, ooh, I upset some some people. I ruffled some feathers with uh, the proper football LeBron James of soccer Christian Pulisic thing. Oh, yeah. I won't go into details, but I was getting in some uh, Instagram arguments about it. Just in the comment section trolling because I was like, he yeah. absolutely is. If you don't, if you disagree, you don't know Pawn Stars and – I got a lot of, first of all, it's football, not soccer. And get yeah. a life. You watch Pawn Stars? I was like, get some bitches. And that was my reply to everyone. And it was really funny. But anyways, oh, what a goal. So, How that. old are you? Too old to be acting the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, painting the, painting the picture here. Here's the scene. You got 91st minute, 92nd minute. You got Maru Sitch with the ball. I thought you were about one year old Ibrahimovic for a second. That as well. Yeah, 91 year old Ibrahimovic. Um, so Marusic, sideline, uh, about their final third. He's got the ball. He's looking for the pass back to Strakasha. Zlatan is intelligently blocking that pass line just perfectly. You watch him the entire time. Not once does he take his eye off the ball, never turns around to, to see Strakasha or see what else is around him. He just knows stand in front of Marusic, do not let this pass get off. And he's moving with him perfectly. Yes, blocking pass lines is like day one. You'll learn that. But how many players on our team do it? Zero. Mm. So Zlatan, football and IQ, of course, knows where the ball is, knows where the goal is, always there, right position. Doesn't turn around until the ball passes his head exactly. 
You got Rebic putting pressure on Marusic, but Marusic can't get that pass off. So what does he do? He turns around. Who's there? Rebic. Now we have possession. Rebic runs back. That's when you see Zlatan immediately come back onside. Again, never turns around. He knows where goal is. He's watching the ball the whole time. He's moving. Now he's onside. Rebic throws that, that cross. Actually a terrible cross because it goes well over Zlatan, who he was aiming for. Zlatan immediately turns around, sees it. Um, I can't remember the, the Lazio defender's name, but was it a Serbi? A Cherby? A Serbi, yeah. A yeah, Cherby. okay. So he gets the header off. Terrible header. Uh, right to Zlatan. You see Tonali push him down, by the way. He gets GBH'd to the ground. By yes, Tonali he does. Love to it. Into fans. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> then Zlatan, normally, if this is Giroud, if this is any other player, heading it as hard as they fucking can at goal. Zlatan is Spot too on. smart to do that. He says no. Tonali is right Still there on. in front of a downed player. He's got the shot. And Strakasha thinks they're going to head it on goal. So he doesn't. He does a tight little grounded header. So now he's right there to to settle the ball and then just toe poke it in goal shirts off celebration Zlatan's iconic run forward and just rocky music everyone's crying. He always slipping on the running you track. You sounded like the guy who hosts Hot Ones, Sean and Evans. Then, yeah, you mm. sound like Sean Evans at the very end there, and I was like, I could kind of <laughs> see it. They both have short hair and I respect. I, yeah, I like Sean Evans. Yeah. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, I zoned out because That's cool, you don't like Zlatan. Uh, I don't. I mean, I like Zlatan. He's a, a legend of the game, as some people would say. But uh, for those reasons, he is my top for this match. By the way, we don't win this game without him. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we do because uh, I just I think we do. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no facts about that. Oh, just also, yeah, and he him. played like thirty-five minutes or or twenty-five minutes. He sixty-five. Yeah, did nothing minutes. besides that one assist. You're wrong. Do you know what? I, I, You're wrong. I actually think that um, he gave something completely different. I thought he was pretty good. He wasn't yeah. mobile. He's not like what no. we saw in the first half of the season, you know, where he was dropping in and facilitating build-up play. But he was he was offering something that Giroud couldn't because Giroud was tired, unfortunately. And, Although he um, did have a chance to score a winner himself, and he just froze up. <sighs> I think yeah. he just genuinely did not expect the ball to just land at his feet there. I think he was like, wait. Dude, man. the commentary like, team on BT was saying, like, what a vital intervention that is to deny Zlatan. Zlatan had shanked that shot wide, and the deflection nearly took it in. But, yeah. You know, yeah. That, the, do you know what? Even to be there, to anticipate, this cross might come to the far post, and I could be there for it. You know, there's the stuff like that you can't teach. But, yeah, whether or not we'd have won the game, with, without, I think the, the substitutions did make a difference. They drew a lot of questioning. At the time, I think some people were furious that Leal came off, for example. Some people questioned Krunic coming on and obviously Rebic as well because he's under scrutiny at the moment um, in, in general. But they did. They gave us a little bit of something just to get over the line there. Rebic in particular, as I say, was fantastic. His hustle, um, his grinter was just sensational. That bit at the end as well, where in the last minute of injury time after we'd scored... He held on to the ball by dribbling past about three players in midfield mm -hmm. and then casually laying it. I really think this is to start something for Rebic and, and that he gets his confidence back because he's the kind of man, as, as we saw last season, who can be decisive in the stretch. Um, Yeah, just I thought amazing Rebic, scenes at the end. He's been looking better and better each week, even though we shit on him every week. I, do I think that I the... Agree. I honestly think Rebic is one of those players who would respond best to being criticised a lot because he's done it twice already. His first two seasons, he did nothing in the first half of the season, really. And then there was all these talks about, oh, he could be leaving, you know, he could have his loan terminated when he was here from Eintracht. And and then out of nowhere, he goes on this hot streak and, um, you know, he loves the, the celebration, like with the finger in the ears. I remember that. Um, and I thought if he scored, he would do some kind of similar celebration last night. But uh, yeah, just delighted for him to have a hand in the goal and incredible scenes at the end there. The the passion from Tonali, we know it because he's a boyhood Milanista. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, he, he's going to feel goals that little bit more if that's possible than his teammates. But to go sprinting over to the 13,000 travelling fans that were there, it really did feel like a home game. We must say that. The support was absolutely magnificent. I know Lazio were protesting and stuff, but yeah, the, our fans were incredible, never stopped singing, and they got their reward. Uh, I loved seeing all the team celebrate after the goal and at full time. Um, just this collective unity that we have, it just keeps us all believing. 
even though we might not be the favourites at this moment in time, we are at least going to have an interesting end to the season, which we didn't have last season because we'd have fallen away by this point already. Hot take that you guys are going to agree with me on because uh, we're just Milan we fans. Do, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Because uh, I know ball. That goal by Tonali is going to have a more of a positive season swaying impact than the Derby victory will for Inter in the long run. I think Inter will have been won that game, um, entering extra time, thinking that's it. You know, they, they couldn't get it done here. Um, we will now go, what would it be, four points ahead or three points ahead uh, with a win against Bologna. But then seeing us celebrating like that in the last minute, there will have been a bit of fear. They won't admit it because their fans are all generally quite pathetic. Um, but yeah, they will have been watching that thinking, oh, shit. Yeah, you know, they're saying, they, wow. They've, they've found a way. Yeah. Yeah. They they crushed us and they said, for sure, that's it. They're done. They, they're, they can't crawl out of this hole. And then they watched us fight till the last second, something we haven't done all season, really. And uh, we, we pulled it out. We have done we, it this we, season. We've done it a few not, times. Not recently. Yeah. But Remember I think they're going to see that and be like, holy cow, they're, they're going to fight and it's going to be hard. And I think that's going to get in their head more. And their derby victory is already behind them. I think they're already like, damn, we got two more games to play than to chase and uh and we're not we're not stopping so it, it, look i mean the the next week of action could be decisive or it could not be obviously that's a factual statement but um they've got bologna in midweek that's your game in hand um win it and fair enough you've taken sole possession of first place don't win it and all of a sudden, fate's back in our hands. That game on Wednesday night is of enormous magnitude. And, and that's not an easy one, as we found out. Game. As we is found it? out, that's not an easy one. No. They're still pushing I mean, it, for the... They got the... I don't it will know be, how to phrase it, but because... they got the Miha stuff that's driving them right now. Even though they have nothing to play for, they're they're playing for him. They're unbeaten in four. Them. Yeah. Um, and they don't concede many goals. But, you know... Mihailovic teams tend to bend over for Inter. Um, so we'll see. We'll see about that one. But even if they win it, it it's only what's expected them, if that makes sense. And, and I've got the, the games that might be decisive in their running um, are the games against teams that are relegation threatened, like Cagliari away might be a tough game for them yeah. all of a sudden, um, especially after they got dragged into it by losing to Genoa yesterday. So, you know, Title's out one on paper. It'll be won by whoever holds their nerve in, in this last four or five games, as we know. Obviously, we've got the harder fixtures on paper. People are arguing that it could play into our hands because we're playing teams that concede a, little, um, a lot more space. But the, the next game is the final. You know That's the way that we've got to look at it. As long as we keep taking care of our business, then the chances of them slipping up probably increase that little bit more. Um so, yeah, the, the next week's going to be massive. I thought at first that Inter play twice before we next kick a ball. So we could be, no. you know, substantially behind them. But they play just before us on the sun, uh, just after us, sorry, on Sunday. We've got Fiorentina and then they've got. So that could be a good chance to flip the script and hopefully beat Fiorentina and pile the pressure back on them. Yeah. Um, Especially you know. if they, they drop against Bologna, which I. I got this weird feeling that they're going to. I really think yeah, they will. But we need them to drop points later in the season. I mean, it's like the last four weeks, but in the last like two weeks, because if we go ahead this week, we're not going to hold it. I really I don't, don't think that we will. The chasing I mentality that, could do us a bit of good. I, I think them. that we're, we play so much better when we're chasing them than when we are being chased. <laughs> I just think any drop points this this late in the season. I get what you're saying, but I think this late in the season, whoever drops points first, mentally done. They're just yeah, gonna die off. We've been chasing the past twelve years, ten years. Huh. You know, kind of like AJ. He's always chasing. You never <laughs> just get. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is a dig. Uh... That is super. So Sorry, I just had to take my sh my uh, shot when I. Could. Yeah. Anyway, so just quit or no? You can if you want to. Uh, this team knows how to chase. And so once we have players who know how to win championships, then protecting the league will become what we're 
good at. I hope so. I hope so. Because I'd still, all, I'd always rather be in a position where you know you've got an advantage of some sort, um, because you know that you can extend that advantage with one slip and one positive result. We've missed the chance to do that so many times this season, which is what makes me think that yeah, we we we're not good at holding on to um, to a points lead. And maybe if we just miss out, we'll look back on those games, the Bologna at home, the Torino away, and all the numerous ref decisions and say margin of cost us this season um or maybe we could do it even in spite of that so it's going to yeah. be fascinating i mean if um, we lose the league by anything less than than eight points we've been robbed factually like well uh, yeah by I, the sheer I number of be, referees that have been suspended post games like it's it's true you know so i will be hand stitching a scudetto patch on my next home shirt if we lose the league by six points or less just because i think that that's you know that that's a reasonable thing to do that's yeah, totally normal behaviour. Uh, tops and flops for the Lazio game, and then we will move on to the talking points. My top was Sandro Tonali. I agree with you. I just watched him play, and I was like, I have not enjoyed watching a Milan player play like this in a very long time. And then he scored, and then I was really fucking happy. That's a good way. Mine was that then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you did say that. You did say that. Um Tenali really dynamic display in midfield. He looked to have that bit of confidence back, which was good. He's looked leggy in the last few games, and then a report came out after the game saying that he's had a bit of pain somewhere that has been affecting him in the last few games. And I think we mm-hmm. saw him just returning to his best yesterday. He looked in a bit more rhythm and he was very good at driving play forward. And Calabria said after the game that Pioli told them in the closing stages uh, to send a midfielder up between their two centre-backs to just pose a different threat and do something a bit unpredictable. And, of course, Tonali scores a goal from that exact position. So Pioli deserves a lot of credit as well. He might just, be the top of the match. I just got a DM from uh, someone. We got a, a guest lined up. Madison knows who it is. Hey, nice. Yeah. I'll tell you after. I don't, I don't want to announce it now because I got to pick a date or whatever, but yeah. It's uh, is it? yes, it is. Yeah, Gattuso, get in. I knew we were going to get in. Um, <laughs> flop of the match. Uh, I am going to go. Oh man, this is tough because I don't want to do it again. And I know that you've gone with the same. I was disappointed with the way that that first goal was conceded, so I'm I'm finding it hard not to go with that. So, so because I picked them for the inter game, I'll go with Brian Diaz. I was hoping that he'd find things a little bit easier operating in space because Lazio in the home league game and the home cup game have been two of his better performances this season. Um, he's had a bit of a bit of freedom to operate in and he looked dangerous. Just wasn't happening again. You know, when Rade Krunic mm-hmm. comes on in that 10 role and looks better, um, it doesn't look great for you, does it? So I'm going to go with him. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to pick the center back pairing. Um, one thing I just want to point out because I think it's a really interesting fact, and it's kind of ironic given given how uh, Liao got an assist. But Liao and Teo are the only players on our team with more forward passes than back passes this season, and I think that's insane uh, for a team that's this high up the table. So I just wanted to point that out. Like that's how negative we play football at the moment. But um, I mean, it worked because the back pass was Liao's assist. Anyways, my flop, uh, unrelated to that entirely, center back Perry. <laughs> yeah, good, nice. Um, I will go with that as well. But Teo's also been very unimpressive lately. He just looks like his head's in the clouds. He just had a baby. He's probably not sleeping no excuses, much, man. We, yeah, we. we You'll we, find I'll, out real soon. It's an excuse. I'll be <laughs> here every week after I have the baby. Oh man, uh, write that down. Say that now. That. Yeah, recorded. Uh, yeah, the, the thing that, uh, like, you know, just to be being, clear, um, I personally am not having a baby. Be impressive. Live stream that. Um, yeah, like, you know, bugbears in football, stuff that happens all the time that really pisses you off. One of mine is um, say a man's under pressure near the touchline or, or near the byline or whatever, and there's somebody, you know, putting them under pressure, making sure they can't get a pass away, and then that man fouls them. For absolutely no reason at all. You know, they've got their man in a difficult position. They can't get anywhere. Teo did that. Um, I think it was Radu, or it might have been Lazzari, who was shielding the ball, and he can go nowhere. He can't pass back to Strakosha. 
Um, his best bet is probably to kick it out for a throw in. And Teo just shoved him over. And I'm like, what are you doing? You've got him right where you want him. Teo sometimes makes these boneheaded plays. And I'm like, man, if you could just cut those out of your game. And if you mm-hmm. stop running inside every time you get the ball and going over as if you've been fouled, because referees are getting wise to that now. Um, yeah, that was a bit annoying. But look, still a match winner on his day. Um, and, and it's fantastic. And him and Liao make sure that we can function the way that we do. So I can't have too much hate for them too. Yeah. Superb. Still top. Uh, we got one Woo. more game to cover first, actually. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> right, Fiorentina. I think um, even prior to, to the win against Lazio, I would say this is our toughest remaining game. Now, people might say, what about Atalanta? People might say... Uh, Verona typically is the place where we go and um, suffer, you know, dents to our title hopes, if you go way back, that is. Um, And Aswolo away is always tough because they are free-flowing. But Fiorentina are the team outside of the top three that I've been most impressed by this season from a footballing perspective. They score a shed load of goals. They're still doing that, even having lost Dusan Vlahovic. Their recruitment for me has been pretty spot on. Italiano's a great manager. I'm not surprised that he's been linked with Napoli, um, even though it'd probably be a step across the way to the internet scene. Um, they're actually out of the Champions League race just yet. It's going to be a tough ask. You know, they've got, I think it's seven points to make up. Um, but yeah, they're, they're on a pretty... They lost 2-1 to Salernitana. Now, that's pretty bad. That's, that's not a good result, you know. Um, but prior to that, they were on a good run. They won four out of five, including winning away at Napoli. Um, they've beaten Atalanta this season. They've put six past Genoa. Um, you know, they beat us 4-3 earlier in the season. So they are not a team to be taken lightly. And Piontek plays there. So hmm. he's guaranteed so, to score at least one. Let me um, discredit everything Disagree you just said. Disagree every... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This can be a cakewalk, as I usually say. Just looking at our lineup in the reverse fixture, Tataru Shanu in, in goal. We had Gabia and Kier as our starting center back partnership. We had Salamakers and Diaz up top. Um, they had Dusan Vlahovic, who is no longer a Fiorentina player. So you look at that, then you remember wow, we conceded like three very, very silly individual errors for goals in that game. Then you look at how we scored. Zlatan with an incredible brace and then a, an own goal um, from them in like the 95th, 96th minute or something late. We got Zlatan now in late stage title push form. I think he's going to start. I know he's what probably not 100 What form are you talking about? The form that just won us the game. He's uh, back. He's back. I mean, oh he played God. the most minutes of his Milan career this season yesterday. 35 minutes, whatever it may be, he's going to start. And he was walking the pitch. If he starts the game, we will lose. You're wrong. You don't know ball. No. You, you don't don't I don't know ball. You Who don't know ball. With 10 men. You, Put you, him on in the last You don't know ball. Minutes. Having you on the podcast is like recording with two men then. It's, Damn. it's two I'm and a half men right left. here. Welcome to CBS. Uh, it's more like one Maybe that could be the title, two and a half men. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so I think we're gonna we're, we're gonna do the thing as I always predict a victory. It's the way it should be, um, you know. But the what was I gonna Look say? You there? super fan predicting exactly. wins every single week. How yeah. can you not, man? All you I'm gonna say is that I, I I predicted us to lose to Inter in the cup, and I predicted us to beat Lazio two once. I'm I'm looking pretty good. So yeah, and I'm bets. I'm wrong often when I predict uh, <laughs> these thrashings. So it's all good, you know. No, but all, yeah. I do think this Balance. one plays into our favor. I mean, we've beat them consistently besides this 4-3, which, again, we had probably our worst possible lineup in that game. And three of our goals were just silly concessions. And they don't have their top goal score anymore. So I think we're going to do very well here. I think we're going to win, but I don't see Zlatan in the in title pushing form at all. You're really, really not happy with that. I mean, he's realistically probably not going to start, but I would love to see it. I think we need to yeah. get him back on there. I think Giroud's kind of... He needs the break. He's put in his shifts. Mm. 
he does need a break without a doubt. I mean, um, Pioli has apparently given the players two days off, so they won't come back into training until Wednesday. I think mm-hmm. that has its positives and its negatives, but hopefully one of the positives is that it allows Ibra to just manage everything, his knees, his arthritis better. Um, and well, and that's what I'm thinking too. Come back okay, and maybe so play 60. He came on in the 68th minute, so we played till 95, 96? I think 96. Um, so what? what is that? That's 30 minutes, basically. If he gets a good half hour in there, now he's got two days rest, and he didn't get injured for the first time post-game in forever. Well, we don't Who's... know that yet. Well, I mean, it's it's been a few hours. Normally, it's immediately there. Like, oh, yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. knee overload. Um, he's had more knee overloads in minutes. But, uh, yeah, I, th- I think he's <laughs> he should be good enough to do – I don't think they thought he could do a half hour. And then they they had to. Like, we, we don't have a choice. And he did it. Yeah. And he's fine. So give him 45 minutes now. Give him a start. Let's see what could happen. I just think that, I mean, practically speaking, yeah, you want Ibra on there. But there perhaps was another option. And that was maybe to play Rebic up front. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that things worked out the way that they did. Because mm-hmm. it's good for Ibra to be on for a moment like that. And to get the buzz back. Um, yeah. Just looking at Fiorentina, um, I like their team. They signed Jonathan Icone, who I want to sign. He's not ripped and he's not ripped the league up as of yet, but um, he scored a couple of good goals. And um, Nico Gonzalez on the left wing, another player who always seems to play well against us. And they replaced Dusan Vlahovic with Arthur Cabral, and I think that his name is going to be one that pops up a lot in the next couple of seasons he was banging them in for Basel and you know he, he was a a good investment I think to to try and replace Vlahovic which is a tough ask and Piontek's not been terrible actually you know he's found himself scoring goals there um and then yeah the, the same usual names like Baragi, Amrabat, Linkovic you know, the the Fiorentina's most exciting aspect is always their forward group and they always let goals in, but you know they try and outscore teams, and especially that is the case under Italiano. I expect this to be a good game. They've not got much. I mean, they're playing to finish as high as they can, but they should get in a European spot now. And I think top four is just a bit beyond them. Um, so yeah, they're going to scrap, but I think they're going to be open because now why not go for wins? And they have already inflicted some damage. You know, they beat Napoli at the Maradona fairly recently. Um, so I expect this to be a good game. And I, for some reason, think that this might be a 2-2 draw. I'm sorry to be a little bit on edge. You're going 3-0. That. I'm going to go 1-0. Oh. We're going back to Look, I hope you're both right. I hope you're both right. Um, I'm going to say that Piontek's going to score an equaliser for them as well. But I could see it, and he I would do the it. heavy knee slide, two pistol salute. And it he would must do be it. weird if he didn't celebrate, as if to say, I have so much respect for Milan, like I'm not going to celebrate my goal. Yeah, he didn't have respect for us when he went to us. You know, he was thinking that's why he failed, is because he was already looking to his next move. As he was, he and he was talking about Pathetic it too, which is interview. even crazier. Pathetic yeah. interview, scum. Um, yeah. So yeah, predictions in. Let's. Hope for another win. Quick talking points. Takeovers happening. We, we've got a way. I don't think it'll be announced before the end of the season for purposes of stability. But um, the transfer rumours and stuff have kind of quietened down. Some loose links to players like Riyad Mahrez. I don't see that happening. It would be a dream, but I don't see it happening. You know, um, Origi is probably the one that we should talk about. That had gone quiet for a while, but now he's, he's coming in. Um, had a great game, Maddie. Too. What what <laughs> what are your thoughts on on Origi? I mean, you know, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to support him next season, but I'll find a way. Yeah, you know how he's, he's a fucking killer, man. Because he's keeping yeah. Ibra out of the team. I mean, that is enough for you to support him, sure. For sure. <laughs> That's all you need. Um, look, we know what we, we're going to be getting, and it does sound like we're going to get Origi. Um, it's meant to be sort of all agreed in the next few days via another meeting. But yeah, we do know what Origi is. He's never been a regular starter for Liverpool, really, since about 2016-17. They've always had world-class forward group. 
it's tough to start over some of the players. You know, they had um, Salah, Mane, Firmino. Now it's Jot and a bit of Luis Diaz in there. Um, and he wants to try something new. He's 27. He's entering his prime years. Smart player, physical player, fast, but also um, but also technical, as we saw at San Siro um, when he had a very good game against us to knock us out of the Champions League group stages. Comes on a free, going to be a four-year deal. Klopp called him world-class and a legend after the game. Now, I can't help... He said he's the best he... finisher on his team, too. Yeah, he did, yeah. Um, I can't think that he's kind of playing up to Paul the statue of a Ricky type narrative that Liverpool fans have created because of his cult hero status. But I am still excited for him to, to be here. Um, and also, the arrival of him not only makes us younger, but because it's a free transfer, I think it certainly doesn't exclude us making a big investment on an even younger centre-forward for the future um, who can learn from Shrewd, who can learn from Ariki, and if Ibra's still around, then they can learn from them. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that one. I think we've talked about it before, but just wanted yeah, to, we've to get that in there. We've talked about it a lot, but I do think saying it's... That he is coming. Exactly, yeah. It's it's worth mentioning. Um, as far as the sale goes, I think that's done, to be honest, especially after the game. I think that qualification was critical to the the finishing of the deal. Obviously, I don't think anyone thought we weren't going to qualify, but to do it with four games to go, I think now they're like, all right, you know, that was the objective. Let's get this across the line. Because we had that factored into our finances, which is obviously the most important thing when when you're buying an asset is to make sure the finances line up and if they have predicted finances you need to make sure that those predictions come true and now that they have now they can say okay either it's it's what we said it's going to be or it's better and we get the scudetto and we get more money so i think that's done um you saw the reactions you saw the the um I can't say any Arabic names correctly, so I'm not even going to try. But one of the guys who's relevant to the firm making the purchase did the did a tweet to Milan. I think like a Happy Easter tweet or something like that. Mm. Um, first tweet about Milan in the, in like the the ten years he's had a Twitter account, by the way. So that's uh, very and telling. In English. Yeah, and in English. Um, Someone and did then, some uh, stocking. Yeah, uh, yeah. It wasn't me. It was actually Moosh. I just listened to everything he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there was another guy who is big with um, Bahrain, or maybe he was Qatari. I, can't I think, he, no, yeah, Bahrain um, tweeted today uh, or yesterday after the game, Milan, big club, it's time. And then posted a picture that just said AC Milan. So I like, laughed when I saw that. It's like, oh, Milan, big club. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, like, we, knew, yeah. we know that. Thank <laughs> You've you. You've been around, brother. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, um, like, how, how much more telling of a sign is there than those two things, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be done. Speaking of deals that will probably be done now, we've got Champions League. Botman sounds like it's going to be we've done. Everything was in place, but we were just waiting to secure UCL because of the extra revenue it brings. We know we can afford that transfer now. Uh, Invest Corp are fans of it as well, so he will be coming in. So, all good. Things moving nicely. Um, look, even if we don't win the title this year and we end up trophyless, then things are, are sort of moving in, into place to suggest that we can be optimistic going into next season as well. Yeah, Let's we're ahead of schedule some... anyways. Yeah. Let's do some questions. Um, we've quite a few today, I can imagine. Um, Luis Bahia asks, is it time to give Tenali the armband? Do it now and it will make... the Calabria's demotion to back up right back behind Kalulu less painful next season. So the precursor to this is that Romagnoli and Kessie are leaving, who are essentially the captain and vice captain based on longevity and appearances. Mm -hmm. um, Calabria is also a vice captain um, and has worn the armband before. Um, no, I wouldn't give Tanawa the armband yet. No. Yeah, I think he's an unspoken captain, just like Zlatan, so you don't yeah. need to bother with it. I think, you know, Teo's worn it a few times and he's a good candidate. He's He's becoming a a good symbol of the club. So I don't really care who gets it, to be honest with you. I think we're just going to continue to go in order of most appearances. I yeah, potentially. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they also have to have leadership qual qualities, but you know. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't just, the, but, the, but like your ideal, who you... doesn't have that, you know, that, that could be top, top appearances. Like, I don't know the, the list. I just feel like if they've had a, I mean, Sal Maker's got a shit ton of appearances. He's not getting the armband, though. So I guess that's the only one. <laughs> Please, no. Yeah. 
Uh, the, there's two schools of thought for captaincy, and the ideal is that you have both, but you, you either pick a leader who uh, is vocal, who is an actual leader, you know, or you pick someone who leads by example through performances. Ideally, you have someone who's vocal and very good. You know, those are the best captains. Um, I think that Tonali will sort of naturally grow into that that double role type thing. Um, but for the moment, I don't see any reason why after three quarters, well, it's probably more like four-fifths now of a very good season, you would burden him with the extra pressure. You know, you just got to keep letting him evolve into something, hopefully something very special, and then the time will come. Um, for me, it should be Calabria. You know, he, he is a symbol of, of, of the club at the moment because he came through the youth system and because of the amount of appearances he's wrapped up. He made his debut, what, eight years ago now? Um, and I don't think he's been great the last few weeks, I will admit that, but he still gets on the team sheet every week, and he certainly fits into that mould of being a vocal leader, so I think I would give the armband to him for now. Um, as for Kalulu becoming the new starting right-back, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know if we're there yet. Um, Stefano, Brahim or Krunic, who is the better attacking midfielder? I actually think Krunic. I think Krunic has played Krunic. really well the last couple games. He's he's shown up. He's yeah, he's better. He's better. He, <laughs> he offers more. Look, look, if if we're in a game where there's space between the lines, then he might as well not be there. He might as well not be playing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll say it one more time. Try him on the wing. Try, just see if we can get something out of him playing on the wing. Um, and if not, then forget it. You know, we can send him back at the end of the season if that's what we really want, because we'll have Hadley and hopefully we'll sign a really good number 10, like an Asensio or whatever. Um, but yeah, it ain't working. And Krunic, at least for what he lacks in technical ability, he makes up for, in other areas, he's a bigger frame for a start, so he's better leading the press. Um, he physically can hold the ball up better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he can take set pieces. That's kind of like an underrated element of his game, but he scored good free kicks before. You know, that one against Verona springs to mind last season yeah. or the season before. Um, so, yeah, I, I think for now, Krunic, um, it's not great. Start him against either. Fiorentina. Yeah, why not? Uh, Jake, that Milan fan, which of you, which of the remaining fixtures scares you the most? And do you think we'll get any points from now to the end of the season? Also, a nice moustache, bro. I presume that's him, but um, Maddie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> certainly not me. <clears throat> if you haven't seen him at home, as I've said, for all the reasons I've said, I, I think, I this think is... that is my biggest one as well. Uh, Sesuolo, last game of the season. Yeah. Like I know it's an away game. We do better there, but I think that's the one that they used to be our bogey team. And depending on how the season's played out by that point, I think it's either going to come down to the last week or it'll already be decided by the last week. So uh, depending on the mentality there, I think that might be the, the one we drop, if we drop. Sassuolo would love playing us with no pressure, and therefore plenty of space to to exploit because you know some of their forwards are flat track bullies. Um yeah, that they're not. None of them are easy games. You know, Verona away is not particularly straightforward. I think Atalanta's becoming one. I think they're just collapsing. <sighs> yeah, but then our home record against them isn't great either. You know, but that's because yeah, they've been right. great I, the last few seasons. Yeah, I think they're collapsing, so I'm, I'm not as nervous. Some last year, there, I would be. I mean, remember in, in, in the reverse, we scored in the first minute. We were up three nil at halftime. We just got robbed of two goals and we still won it like yeah i don't think they're someone in the chat said and i'll put it out there just so we might be the first to say it um said that atalanta might end up getting relegated in the next three years who said Um, that nikita said that now that's a that is a hot take but yeah it's all yeah it'd be interesting to see what happens when the gasparini burnout takes place you know if they really do drop off the cliff because their form setting half of the season that has been no bueno um michael gambino thoughts on rebic liao and messias at the end of the game should this be used more as a trident in the final games yeah i thought i, I don't know how much of it looked great because it was in game and therefore oh sorry i don't think chuck agrees with it no nah, he um, doesn't like him 
No. Um, I yeah, I don't know how much of it looked good because, you know, there's more space at the end of the game and therefore anyone who's out there looks looks a bit better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Levitch and Liao looked like they could coexist for that brief period before Liao came off. Uh, came, came off. Um, and Junior definitely offers more than Salamakas still. You know, a couple of his yeah. dribbles yesterday were fantastic. That one where he knocked it over the sliding challenge and then, then went through. Um, I was think, thinking, um, and Bader watched the game with me at the bar, and this was actually his idea that I'm going to piggyback off of, but I thought it was a good one. Macias is attacking mid because he just doesn't have a right foot. Um, invert Liao to right wing because he's the most talented winger we have. He, If anyone could switch wings, it'd be him. And then Rebic on, on the left wing. And I think that provides us the most attacking-minded front three or attacking mid trident, whatever you want to call it. I still don't. I mean, Pioli says that Rebic doesn't like playing right wing. Um, he's That's done why it for I the said left wing. Team. Yeah, no, I know. But I'm just saying that he seems like the most natural candidate to do it because he's done it for the national team. Um, we know the chemistry that Liao and Teo have down the left side, so you wouldn't want to disrupt that. We generally have the harder working winger on the right side, which Rebic tends to be. That seems to make a lot of sense on paper, but for whatever reason, he, he hasn't done it yet. Um, so, yeah, maybe... Liao did drift out to the right in, in periods last 20 minutes of, of yesterday. Um, tough to tell if that would work from the start. I, I don't know. It's always hard to judge when it's the last 15 minutes of games because it's yeah. stretched enough as it is. Um, <laughs> a few people asking um, for Maddie's thoughts on, on Divock Origi joining, which, which is which is funny. No offense. Um, <laughs> right, fine. Final one. Um, Rohit asks. No, did people actually it, ask that? Yeah, they did. I saw it too. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. For Maddie as an Everton support, how do you feel about how do you feel about Divock Origi? Someone said rubbing salt on his wound, which might be a euphemism. Um, so we got linked during the week. I don't know if either of you know anything about this guy, um, Maxence Kakare who plays for, for Lyon. Um, I haven't seen too much of him, but he is apparently you know, a, a midfield target of ours. And someone asked, would we rather have him or Renato Sanchez? Uh, and the answer is Renato Sanchez, I think. Yeah, yeah, simply because I don't know the other guy. He could be mm. 10 times the player, but I've never seen him. So if, if it's up to me, I'm picking the guy I've seen. You know, I just, nothing against the other dude. No. I, the first time I heard his name was the linking. And it, I just don't watch any Leon. Um, I don't have access to it here. My cable provider does not carry the channel that uh, carries the French League, so I just don't watch it. Same. Mm. And if AJ was watching it, cause he'd have it, which would mean I would have it, so I'd be watching it. Yep, because Maddie mooches off all my uh, subscriptions. <laughs> Good to no, get that out content. there in the, in the public domain. <laughs> yeah, if anyone um, needs it, just uh, shoot me a text and I'll... Uh, yeah, all of a sudden I'll get a text for a verification code. I get those randomly throughout the night. <laughs> uh, and then a text yeah. from me saying, code? I need that code. <laughs> um, Kakare, and I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, but he's actually meant to be good. People who watch uh, Liga and watch Leon say that he is very good. He's only 22, a um, bit of a diminutive type midfielder. Um, and Leon have a really good trio. Like they've got Hassam Auer and Paqueta. Uh, they lost Bruno Guimaraes to um, to Newcastle. So it sounds like this this guy has stepped up. And yeah, people who I watch would take say Paqueta back. No, I don't okay. know what to say to that man. I don't know probably how. need another half an hour to discuss that. I would love to take him back. I never want to sell him. Yeah, same. I did. We know that's for a whole. That's probably for a whole other episode. But you know, let's well, get Andre Silva break. back. Uh, I right support here. that as well. Actually, I think he <laughs> fit the system. Barini, right wing. Um. So yeah, do you know what? We know that we need a quality midfielder. I don't really care who it is at this point. You know, um, I wouldn't be comfortable paying Renato Sanchez six million a year because he gets injured quite a bit, and I wouldn't want us to run that risk. So, if a financially better alternative arrives, then I trust the management to go for whatever they choose to go for. That's it. Then, boys, uh, thank you to everyone who made it this far. Um, it's been a good one. Managed to get over the depression with a lot of joy. Uh, good to talk through our issues on a personal level and everything. So, yeah, thank you if you if you made it this far. Um, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. You can find me on Twitter 
at Ollie Fisher and been joined by AJ. Yep. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Actually, it was nice to to be celebratory for once, um, as yeah. opposed to celibate, which so close. <laughs> we both know that. <laughs> uh, have you seen this mustache? Come on. Um, yeah. So Tory Forty is it getting up? Never mind. I'm not even gonna say it. Yeah. Edward underscore underscore Toth. Yeah, uh, like, comment, subscribe on the on the video. Um, tell your friends about us. That's the first time I've ever said that. But yeah, tell your friends about us. Tell your friends about uh, the guy with the with the eighties mustache and the the fancy shirt every week. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, share our stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll catch you in a week's time. Ante, ecco l'ante ante in area di rigore. Ante ante, ante ante. Ibra, gol. Vediamo se è buono, ce lo da buono, ce lo da buono, ce lo da buono.